This is an idea uh, that I'm very passionate about, and its uh, basis, its source, are a consistent set of questions that I got and a consistent set of requests that I got when we decided to move back to Armenia two years ago. The question that, ha that people posed to me before moving and after moving was, why? Why are you leaving San Francisco? Why are you leaving the U.S. to go back to, to Armenia? And I'm not going to answer that question because that's a whole different topic. Uh, but this is aimed at trying to find the, uh, a, a, a method for other people to go through the same decision process. The request was, for many of my Arme friends in diaspora, was find me a job so that I can move to. So uh, that really got me to thinking about what it is that drives people to make decisions in their lives, especially decisions such as deciding to move back to either the place they were born, um, for many Armenians that have left Armenia, um, uh, and are thinking of coming back, or for many of the people that have been on stage today whose parents were forced to leave for a variety of reasons through the centuries and always think about coming back to the homeland. So I've called this digital brain fill. Uh, let's start with the problem. The problem is brain drain, and I want to speak specifically about the statistics that Hans brought up in his, uh, during his discussion, which is 48% of the people in Armenia uh, would choose to leave if they could, and furthermore, only 17% said we would never come back. So what causes that? Um, if we think about what's happening, Armenia is a small landlocked country with a small economy, a very constrained market, and not just the market being small in size, but lots of constraints imposed upon that market in terms of uh, control by elites, inefficient government, lack of transportation, you name it. So, and this applies not just to Armenia, but many similar countries, and small market doesn't necessarily, necessarily mean just small, it could be, it's a very constrained market, like India used to be until they started to reform their markets. And so naturally this leads to uh, a large wave of emigration, and unfortunately, as many people know, the concept of brain drain is that the, the people that are most able, most intelligent, that are most forward-looking are the ones that are going to try to leave first. And typically what happens is that governments realize this and try to do certain things to uh, to stem that tide of people leaving, so trying to provide better education, providing incentives for people to try to move back, tax incentives or other incentives, or you know, even coming up with Welcome Back or Adi Doon or various different programs to try to get people to reconnect with their homeland. But unfortunately, all of the things that a government can do, all of the things that NGOs can do, all of the things that private enterprise can do, are still constrained within that small market. And so, in most cases, repatriation is only a trickle, is only a small percentage of the people that are leaving. And this in turn leads to a vicious circle where the small market shrinks to become smaller and smaller and becomes uh, much more it's much more difficult for them to compete in the marketplace. So can we turn this around? Um, in fourth grade, I remember very clearly, I've, I've never practiced martial arts, but one of my friends was taking judo and he said, you know, the, the basic concept of judo is use your opponent's force as a way to fight him. Don't try to create that within yourself. And I started to think about the Armenian market. It's small, um, landlocked, not a lot of natural resources. But if you think about emigration, if you think about the wave of Armenians that have left over the last 20 years since the breakup of the Soviet Union, over the last 150 years since the various uh, Ottoman Empire uh, massacres and ultimately the genocide, those people are now living around the world and have created new um, networks, they have experience, and the idea is how can you, how can you uh, uh, harness all of that uh, economic achievement, for the lack of a better word, to try to bring that back to Armenia. So the concept I've sort of been noodling with is how do you track what I'm calling economically successful emigrants, ESCs, people that have gone abroad that have become successful lawyers or doctors or artists or um, university professors, whatever that might be, and how can you get them to think about how to come back and help this economy grow? So what did we look for, my wife and I, when we were thinking about coming back? Um, having lived in the West and enjoyed sort of, uh, many, uh, the, the level of, um, of income and activity in the West, if you like, number one is some, something that's close to developed world income, because ultimately, if you spend all that time trying to build something, you don't want to just all of a sudden throw it away all at once. Secondly, a safe environment for your family, uh, education and opportunity for your children, um, and a smooth transition and repatriation process. And finally, uh, favorable tax climate, meaning that you're not stuck between two worlds and paying taxes to two different governments. I'm not gonna, going to focus on 
the numbers uh, two through five, but I do want to spend some time. This talk is about number one. So how do you create a developed world income in Armenia? Let's go back to that simple concept of creating that network. Use the experience you have, the network of people that you've built, and the relationships as an asset. That means, uh, for example, um, a, someone that's a successful accountant that has built an, a successful accounting practice, but that has a partner. Uh, the, the partner could stay in the developed world country, he or she could move to Armenia and do a lot of the same work, do a lot of the back office work from here. And still, the important thing, the, the critical thing, is that the income is not based on the small Armenian market, it's based on the large global market that uh, Armenians in the diaspora have all been integrated into. That's the, if there's one thing you take away from this talk today, that's, the, that's it. Um, as I said, income will co continue to come from sources abroad. And the only thing that changes, really, is where the economically successful immigrant chooses to live. Um, you know, this, this phenomenon happens in places like the U.S. or in Europe all the time. Somebody builds a successful practice in a major city, but then decides that they want to live close to where they can ski all the time. So there are a lot of very uh, wealthy and successful people that live around Lake Tahoe uh, in California, for example, but that are still fully integrated into the economy that they grew up in. What makes this happen? I loved um, Serge's talk, actually, um, you know, this whole holographic concert, because it really talks to what's changed and what makes this whole concept now uh, possible. So things like iPads, you know, I was actually going to bring my iPad on stage, but Rich beat me to it, so I didn't do that. Um, uh, email, face, social networks such as Facebook, then, uh, Facebook and LinkedIn, and uh, live video conferencing, that's all free. All of these things allow us to do what we know how to do best by not having to be physically present, at least all the time, with the, with the markets that we serve, or the customers that we serve, or the patients that we see. I've got a little bit of time left, uh, so let me walk through this pretty quickly. So is this really happening? Uh, some of this is not new. So Armenia has actually built a fairly successful, sm uh, small but growing enterprise in software outsourcing, chip design, um, translation, and you can see some uh, gra graphic design and web design. So most people are aware of, of outsourcing or doing these things remotely. But more recently, um, it, uh, things have sort of moved upstream in the value chain. So for example, Fugitive Studios is starting to do some audio uh, video post production here. Um, there are uh, things like the Armenian Virtual College or MIT Open Courseware are examples of digital class classrooms that no longer, where you no longer need to be present at the campus to be able to, to get a, a fantastic education. And the last one, medicine, is pretty important, uh, interesting. Let me give two, two examples of that. We have a close family friend who moved, emigrated from Armenia to the Uni United States in the early 90s. And he and his wife wanted to move back and live here. And he's a child psychiatrist, and he had built a very successful practice in Los Angeles. And he, had a, he won a grant to come here and do some teaching at the, at the medical institute, but he wanted to continue his practice. Well, he set up a Skype office in his apartment in Yerevan, and three times a week would see his, um, his patients uh, in Los Angeles via Skype. He was able to keep the connection with them, he was able to keep the income source and do what he wanted, and, and could enjoy the fact that his kids were running around Boxy Hayat uh, in Yerevan without being, you know, uh, enjoying all the, all, all, all the fruits of, uh, of, uh, of Armenia. Similarly, my brother is a radiologist, he was at the um, Massachusetts General, uh, in, which is the Harvard Hospital, and his wife is Spanish, they wanted to raise their kids in Spain. And he first looked into becoming a radiologist in Spain, well he would have made a third of the income he was making in the US. What he now does, he gets up every morning at 6 a.m. in his pajamas, goes to his little office in his apartment, and for four hours reads uh, emergency cases from 700 hospitals all over the U.S. and Canada because, and it's, it's great for the hospitals because they no longer need to keep an emergency radiologist uh, or on-call radiologist at night. His company has 60 radiologists around the world that just read these cases and send them back uh, in the middle of the night for the U.S. A third example that's closer to home here is that one of my, one of my radio engineers at, at, at ICON, his sister and her husband both were uh, uh, grew up in Harazdan here, were educated in Moscow, and were both software programmers in Moscow. They similarly wanted to move back to Armenia to be closer to the grand for the kids to be closer to the grandparents, and they took uh, only a 20% pay cut from what they were making in Moscow, and they now work for their company working out of their apartment in Harazdan. So the point is that you don't need to give everything up um, it's not like charity work. It's not like saying, you know, I need to go back and, and fight the fight that I fought every day to leave the country. There are ways to make that uh, better. Um, so what's different? 
The great thing is the size of the no, uh, local market is no longer an issue. The inefficiencies of the local market is no longer an issue. And for many of us that have dealt with this, the influence of local elites is no longer an issue. Your market isn't here. They don't know you exist because your income is coming from abroad. That's the important thing. And, um, and the near-term economic prospects of the country no longer an issue, although if we do this right, we create a, vis uh, a, a vir virtuous circle where, um, where we can have uh, people that have come back to each other and the, and the, loop, and the loop continues. So what's, how do we make this work? World-class communications infrastructure. I'm really happy to say that in, the internet has improved greatly over the last two years. Um, uh, not, certainly not just thanks to us, but because of a lot of investments that gone, that's gone to the country. Um, what we do need is a simple tax regime that makes it easier for people to live here while earning income abroad. And use social and professional networks. Facebook is a great way. A lot of our friends keep up with our lives here um, through Facebook and uh, create virtual circles. I'm not going to spend time on this build. Basically, the point is that somebody comes back and hires their uh, local professionals, and then those professionals go through the training loop. So the magic formula is uh, emigration, or the emigrant, which is deemed to be a liability to the, to the future development of the country by adding the global experience of the emigrants, technology, and a policy that helps uh, repatriation equals the what I'm calling the digital brain fill national asset. Thank you very much.